live with Stan Osserman. Hey, aloha from Connecticut. Nothing is too good for the Think Tech audience there in Honolulu. So my HCAT team has traveled all the way here, over 6,000 miles from Honolulu to Connecticut to be with the folks from U.S. Hybrids, U.S. Fuel Cell uh, Detachment that makes some of the best fuel cells, at least in my opinion, in the entire world. And we're here with um, Dan Orlowski and Michael Harrington, uh, the uh, program manager and chief engineer, respectively, here at the at the plant. And we just finished having a, a tour in the back there and looking at all the magic stuff. But uh, we like coming out this way and talking to the guys who have done this as, as a whole career, basically, and have some great insight on the technology because that's what the show is all about, talking about the technology, uh, the energy technology that makes tomorrow the 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 thing that we need to do to clean up our, our environment and, and do transportation right. And that's what these guys do. They make some great fuel cells that uh, we're hoping to see a lot more of in our in our vehicles. So, Dan, thanks for being with us today, all the way here from, Thank from you, Connecticut. Sir. And Mike, have a nice time. Show. And uh, it was a great tour we just had. So um, why don't we start with uh, with Dan and just kind of tell everybody how you got into your, this kind of, of work. You know, what oh, this line of work? Yeah. yeah. Goodness, uh, I was working for an electronics uh, contract manufacturer that uh, was building the electrical balance plant for uh, the fuel cell buses that are running out in California. And uh, that's how I got involved. Uh, I then uh, applied and got into United Technologies and the, when it was UTC fuel cell. And uh, that's how I, I started my career in fuel cells and spent five and a half years with uh, United Technologies. Mike? Uh, my dad said, get a job. Okay. And so, and move yeah. out and get a job. Move out and get a job. <laughs> and so, uh, I went to an engineering school, actually, uh, the same engineering school that Dan went to. Um, and when I graduated, I had a, a few different choices and, you know, Air Force, Navy, uh, and fuel cells. And I was like, wow, what's that? And so, United Technologies offered me an opportunity to, to clean up the planet. And, you know, it was. Uh, what my research at and during my master's degree was, and so it really you know, fit in. So I spent eight years uh, in the fuel cell world, jumping in with United Technologies, uh, working on automotive products, working on stationary products, uh, and then moving off uh, and doing some lithium ion battery work as well. Uh, six years in the, the lithium battery world, but you know I started as a mechie and somehow I ended up in electrical, and I've been doing electrochemical ever since. Great. Now here we are working for U.S. Hybrid, working for a boss. We had a boss on for a couple shows uh, earlier uh, last month, and he did a great job of explaining uh, logic behind fuel cells, especially um, the fact that technologically we're there, um, and the real choice is economics at this point. You know, getting the economics to match up, getting the infrastructure out there so the fuel cells can be used, and that's really the the point that we're at. Um, but one of the things that, that I'm always faced with uh, in Hawaii, I, I always get this question, and with your battery background and the two of your experience, is, you know, when we compare batteries and fuel cells, um, it's always this, well, batteries, uh, more energy out for energy in than a fuel cell. More, basically, you get more bang for the buck when you have a battery. And people stop there with the efficiency of power in, power out. But there's more to it than that. So. You know, what are your some of your thoughts, uh, Mike, on that? Well, batteries still have a finite storage, and they're they're still very heavy. So it, it's you say power in and power out, and the efficiency can be high, but they're still very susceptible to environmental changes. Um, and the 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 hydrogen source is uh, it's much uh, more pure and available actually than the uh, than the electricity. So you can have long-term storage. So batteries are really good for short-term storage and they make economical sense. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for a long-term uh, opportunity to store energy, say seasonal, which is something I hadn't really thought of until I actually got to talking to some of the grid people who are saying, you know, we need to store energy for a long time. We've got this excess energy from the grid. What do we do with that? I can't put it in a battery. My battery is going to fill up too quick mm -hmm. or it's going to be, right. you know, a battery the size of Texas. Right. So they said, well, I can, you know, pump hydro is pretty popular, but if you don't have hydro, I can roll up a hydrogen tank and I can actually, you know, store it as hydrogen, save it for not just, you know, like daily periods where most of us stop thinking about, 
but for monthly or even longer term, where you can actually see seasonal changes. And, and, and yeah, Mike talked about the the, the the yeah the weight and also the um, the control the climate the climate mm -hmm. piece. You know, one of the things that that I think people get confused is they hear that fuel cells basically just expel water out the exhaust pipe, mm -hmm. and so they immediately think, well, then it won't work in cold climates because it's got water in it. Um, why don't you explain that technology and, and fuel cells? Well, it's all how you manage the water. Uh, that's where whether or not you can be freeze capable versus freeze tolerant versus uh, not tolerant at all of being able to be freeze is, is how do you uh, deal and manage your water on uh, as an engine as a whole. So not only is your you have your cell stack technology has to be freeze tolerant mm -hmm. and freeze capable. But then the rest of your balance plant, as we call it, the, the, all the other parts of your engine, which uh, comparably to a internal combustion engine will be your water pump and right. oil pump and all those other uh, heat exchangers and things like that. Also, need, you need to just deal with it in a way to, to make that engine as a whole survive those conditions. So your fuel cell, assuming it's built for cold climates, it's, mm -hmm. it's engineered properly for it. Controlled expansion and things like right. that, and keeping your seals tight and they don't leak. Mm -hmm. um, if you had a battery and uh, a fuel cell side by side, um, what are some of the consider? I mean, a fuel cell starts to make heat as soon as you turn it on, right. but a battery, it's if it's cold soaked, is cold soaked. You know, so I mean, you get less energy out of it, and certainly when a fuel cell is initially cold, you're not going to get as much energy right. out of it. But as but it warms up, as it warms up. But because your battery was your energy storage medium, if the energy storage went away because it got cold, it, it's gone. It's dead. The, the charge left. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's part of the problem. Right? And the efficiency of the battery at low temperature, like negative 30 or negative 20, is, is usually only around 60%. So if you tried to do that normal commute of 40 miles in your bolt, you'd only have 60% of that range right. if the battery stayed at that temperature. So you, I didn't even think about that. If you just had a purely electric vehicle mm -hmm. and you're purely counting on batteries, then you also have a reduced uh, performance just because of climate. Yeah. I mean, I've never even really thought about even that. Even the Chevy Volt, they intentionally heat the coolant system to bring the battery up to temperature. Right. So do they use internal battery power? Or, I mean, is that something where you, when you're plugging yeah, in, essentially. it's like a, like a block heater that when you plug it in, it keeps it all warmed up? And they also intend to build, they have the control space they set up so that when you turn on the bolt, it has a gas engine. So it actually heats using the internal combustion engine at the low temperature. So it's one way that they get around it. See, these are some of the things that in Hawaii we don't talk a whole lot about because if it gets to down to 60 degrees, we bust out the parkas, you know, and, right. you know, if it gets down to 50, we declare our state of emergency and, you know, things like that. But, but, but these cars are going to be built for everybody, not just right. for Hawaii. So they've got to be able to work in 30 below, 40 below, and yeah. also 110 or 115 in Arizona. And, you know, it's, they've got to be able to survive that full climate range. So do the fuel cells do as well in that full spectrum? Depends on the type of fuel cell. Well, I mean, so if it's made for transportation, and I mean, I'm assuming uh, that for transportation, you make them pretty rugged. Yeah, yeah. The, the fuel cells that, that we've made, uh, mm -hmm. certainly now and in the past, have been capable of doing you know negative 30 degrees C all the way to 50 degrees C. Right. And yeah. you have the equipment to test it. Yeah, right. and we have really big thermal 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 chambers thermal. that can go from negative 50 to, uh, to 80 degrees C. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a good time in the summer if you want to cool down. You just mm -hmm. open up the chamber. And <laughs> okay. So what size fuel cells, I mean, give us an idea in, in a motorcycle you might use, or that kind of a vehicle, how big a fuel cell versus all the way up to maybe an electric train, like a, 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 city, a city train. What are the size fuel cells that would fit in those kind of vehicles? Depending on how you want to use it, right? So in a motorcycle, if you want performance, if you want like your Harley Davidson, you want to speed up, you like that feeling of speed, you're going to need more power to do that. But and that how many watts or kilowatts? You know? want upwards of 100 <laughs> to do something like that. Well, I mean, it, but these you days can get you can't five. get away from the electric drivetrain. So right. no matter what, you're going to be electrified. Right. And you never usually see a fuel cell by itself. You usually see a fuel, fuel cell battery. with a battery. Right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the fuel cell is great for, you know, doing the Keep five and nice ten kilowatts steady. which you would use on a bike. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you'd have a high power battery basically to, you know, get you that. Maybe even a capacitor. Speed. Or a capacitor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some kind of 
<laughs> the electrification is here, though. Yeah. Trains so, need megawatts of power to move them. Yeah, megawatts. That's what but they're using their, they consider fuel cells these days for hotel loads. Okay. That is lights, heating, air conditioning, um, uh, maybe a, a refrigerated car. More so than the traction. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because the traction takes a lot of power and it's more efficient and certainly more energy dense to use the other means. Okay. So we have a couple models here. Yeah. And these are scaled down, of course, and they're, they're 3D printed <laughs> models. But this is uh, basically, and I know it's pretty hard to see when we put it a little closer, but this is basically a 150 kilowatt uh, fuel cell model from, from the company here. Can we talk a, a little bit about what kind of vehicle this would be used in and what are some of the things that make it uh, really good at what it does compared to maybe somebody else's fuel cell? Oh, cool. sure, man. Remember, huh? So this particular fuel cell uh, produces 150 kilowatts um, and it can be scaled up to around 200. It is good for those train applications. It's also good for high-end military applications where uh, maybe power takeoff is important. Uh, it is not sized for your typical bus um, we're talking the uh, what's it, fifty passenger buses, and forty foot, um, yeah, forty foot buses, mm -hmm. uh, because those the average load on those buses the the average load is more towards the eighty kilowatt range, okay, um, even sixty kilowatts. So battery dominant. Battery batteries can take the the the. Um, the acceleration mm -hmm. and what's most important about batteries in those applications um, in in buses is they take the stopping load and, okay. and regen. Fuel cells don't provide you the regen. So this you'd so see more as that hotel hotel or in your maybe in a, even in a, a stationary train. like uh, okay. pull around a trailer type um, application where you need some power. You know, maybe a military application. So some some of the things I've noticed about this when I first saw it was that it's built a lot like a military jet engine or a, an engine that would go inside of a military vehicle because the main component that normally doesn't need a whole lot of work is in its own weatherproof and protective case mm -hmm. and then your accessories, blowers, pumps, things that you might need to change out fairly frequently are all on one side accessible so you could actually design it to fit into a vehicle where this side could have a door that comes down the mechanic could go and work on it, change the parts, close it back up, change a filter, just yeah. open and close. And then if you did have to take the whole thing out, there's lifting points. And you can just pick it up with an engine hoist, pull it out, replace it with a new one, plug it in, and you're off and running again. So right. I thought the modularity of this design was, was really nice. Um, how, about, how about the ruggedness of the design compared to, I mean, you talked about stationary fuel cell applications, and UTC mm -hmm. did that in the past as well. What makes a stationary fuel cell different than something used in transportation? Well, mainly the fuel. Um, it's uh, This runs off of the pure hydrogen supply, which uh, you wouldn't normally use in a stationary application because you wouldn't be uh, paying for pure hydrogen all the time. You'd want to use natural gas uh, with these, uh, if you were to stationary. do a stationary where you would then look at those, uh, maybe a, a direct methanol fuel cell or the uh, phosphoric acid fuel cells, which can take reformate a little better than a PEM fuel cell uh, doesn't take, or at least the ours um, don't take the reformate as well as maybe a, uh, a solid oxide fuel cells. There's okay. so many different types of fuel cells, but the important thing is, is when you look at your type of fuel that's coming in and what you're going to put through the cell itself, you have to pick for it. So. But when you're, you're talking the difference between a PEM and a solid oxide, there's a difference in startup time, isn't that? Oh, big time. And that's yeah. why maybe a uh, someone who's got a stationary application can deal with a longer startup time, just leave it running, right? set it, forget it. But when the automotive world and the vehicle world, you want to turn it on and 30 seconds later, at, at the most, you want to be driving. Right. You, know, you want your power, and so that's what these engines are are, are based upon. Okay, great. Well, we're coming up on our first break here, so we're going to take a sixty-second break and talk about some of the other programs on ThinkTech, and then be back to Connecticut.
Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to figure out how we're going to work towards a clean and renewable energy future. We have exciting conversations with all kinds of stakeholders, everyone who needs to come together to talk about renewable energy, be they engineers, advocates, lawyers, utility executives, musicians or artists, to see how we can come together to make a renewable future. Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward. And the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper to bumper traffic. And this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon and let's move Hawaii forward. And we're live with Stan the Energy Man. Hey, and welcome back to my lunch hour. Of course, right now it's my dinner hour because there's five hours time difference, but same, same. Uh, I've got Dan and Michael here from United, uh, US Hybrid rather, um, mm -hmm. fuel cell uh, section. And uh, we swapped out models here. This is actually, um, I would call it the half size of the model we just showed. A lot more of the accessories on the bottom and the back, but this is their, uh, their, their new uh, version, their 80 kilowatt. And, and this would be used for what kind of applications? Well, this will be used for anywhere you have a diesel engine. Okay. Anywhere. Uh, we see uh, trucks, we see buses, um, you can see uh, street sweepers, you can see garbage trucks. Anywhere where there's a diesel engine, it, it could even be a stationary uh, gen set. This would pop right in. Okay. You had interest for emergency backup, right? Mm -hmm. For um, for like cell like towers trucks. and things like that, or mm -hmm. more like um, relief efforts. Okay. So Japan, you know, after Fukushima, okay. they're very interested Port in portable, portable power, emergency portable power. power. So it's a great portable emergency power. Mm -hmm. And again, it has a quick pickup time um, compared to a solid oxide fuel cell. Oh yeah, yeah, that's within so seconds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But again, on this one, all the components mm -hmm. are uh, accessible for service on the outside. Uh, engine mounted, engine mounts right here, I don't know if everyone can see that, <laughs> but it's basically, it's built around the idea that uh, it's not going to take an engineer to fix anything on this. This is going to take your regular auto mechanic um, to, to troubleshoot, repair, install. Um, and it comes with a fully integrated DC to DC, so you don't have to do your own power conversion. Uh -huh. So you basically get you know the the type of power out that you want. Okay. You can set it to a default or command power voltage current. Okay. Well, that's you, you know you bring up a good point. That is the training, or you know as we grow into this new technology, there's always a training aspect to it. And uh, you know, do we do we talk to the community college and set up a special program to train mechanics to do this stuff? How hard is it to get folks trained into a fuel cell? I mean. I look at this technology, and, and I'm not a super mechanic or anything, but I go, well, that looks pretty familiar, and that looks pretty familiar. And you know, what compared to what an auto mechanic has to deal with it, um, do you think overall it's easier to take care of, or you know, easier certainly, transition to something like this? Certainly, it will be a lot easier. Uh, one of the very first things we did was we start stop calling it power plant. That was the very first thing we did. We start calling it an engine. Right? That's that's important for uh, acceptance. Uh, the industry acceptance, but also it helped then lead the way to pointing out that you know here's your air blower. It's the same air blower you see on automotive. This is a turbo turbocharger. Charger. Yeah, it's just electric drive, which is also becoming a little more prevalent. This here, where we bring in the uh, 200 psi of hydrogen fuel, this is your carburetor on a car. It does the same thing. It regulates how much fuel goes into uh, the pistons, in this case would be the fuel cell. And then on the bottom we have the water management system, which uh, just like in a car, it, it's a lot like how it manages water and oil. Right? So uh, instead of an oil pan, we have a pan for water. And uh, it's got a water pump in it, just like in the car, but instead of being belt driven, it's electric driven. It's, um, everything's pretty familiar. The better thing about this is that 
the number of rotating parts is two. You have a water pump, you have an air pump. That's it. Those are your rotating parts. Those are the wear and tear items. Everything else we use is everything else is automotive. We use a wastegate uh, for overpressure protection. That stuff's all very familiar to people. Automotive fuse box, automotive controllers, um, and you even talked about taking the regular code reader or whatever. Regular code reader. This is code this reader. was very important to us because a lot of the people who started into fuel cells ended up having to get, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment and special programs and software to talk to their terminals. To talk to their battery pack. You have that laptop to talk to your fuel cell engines, this laptop to talk to your powertrain that's the other laptop with that software. Now this uses uh, the diesel, the yeah. diesel engine uh, code reader. The person who's trained to service a diesel engine sure. will be able to look at the thing, look at the code, and the code is already translated to say the code you get to say that your turbo wasn't working right yeah. is the same code that we spent on. I'm sure you'd probably get an app for that. In no time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there are probably apps for probably that. in your iPhone or anything. You don't yeah, even exactly. know it. Yeah. Well, you know, I. I one one of my favorite sayings is the only human being that enjoys change is a wet baby, and um, most people are afraid of change. They're afraid of this technology because like how hard is it going to be to train to, or how complex is it going to be, or how how expensive is it going to be? Um, you know, you've been working in this field for at least a decade, I would say. You know, each mm -hmm. close mm -hmm. to it. Um, how how much has the price dropped in technology and and the simplicity? I mean, all those factors that you you put into something like yeah. remember our cell phones used to be these big clunky bricks with an antenna, <laughs> yeah. four inches, five inches long, you know, and they weighed a ton, they cost a lot, and they had way more power than they needed, and it's probably radiated your ears or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, put that in fuel cell terms. I mean, has the technology really come that far in, in ten years? The technology has. I don't know if the market has quite for yeah. it, but the technology started out really with you know, wire harnesses everywhere and tubes and custom weldments for everything. And now you have 3D printing options for, for you know, a lot more um, customizable components. It went, from the, lab, it went from the lab to, to a real product. That's yeah. where it went. Yeah. yeah. And there were those first few customers that really made it happen, mm -hmm. where they, they took those lab products and, and, and accepted them, and that was good, because we need that field data. So just like a boss said, the technology part we've got wired already. We've, we've yeah, got it right. down, yeah. and the cost has come down quite a bit, and the, the ruggedness has come up, yeah. and the the lifespan has come up on these things. It's just the finances and getting people used to it, and getting the market built, build right. the market, right. capitalizing too. Yeah, you know, it takes a little bit to actually, you know, put all the factories to it. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we we showed two of them. What are some of the other sizes that that you're looking at? So we've got the 150, we've got the 80. Um, what are some of the other sizes you guys actually are in the works building or designing? I think you'll be most excited to know we're going to build you 40 kilowatts. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. That would, that's right in that sweet spot for the kind of small trucks and medium trucks and things yep. like that. And the smaller buses, um, the, the shuttle type buses that a lot of people use. I know that Connecticut had one for a while. So it, it's very useful. Um, it will also be more accepted with the automotive fueling stations mm -hmm. because those stations are going to be built more towards the size of the Marais and stuff. They won't be built to support full-size buses, right? They won't be supporting, uh, they probably won't even allow 40-foot buses to, you know, show up. the gas station. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, so what are some of the other, I mean, besides vehicles, besides trucks, buses, and cars, you know, where do you see these applications going? I know you, both of you have experience in the aerospace side mm -hmm. and space. Um, you know, fuel cells have a long history in the submarines and spacecraft. Yeah. So they've, they've already been there, and that's where a lot of the maturity happened with the technology. But what are some of the other applications you see for fuel cells? I think the big one that's uh, really taking off now is material handling, you know, the warehouses. So the, mm -hmm. the forklifts and... Um, they're not huge fuel cells. They're you know 10 kilowatt, 15 kilowatt fuel cells that are doing it. Um, but they've really helped a lot uh, to just get fleets of data. So you know, Plug Power and other companies are out there 
selling yeah. hundreds of thousands and able to collect field data. And that field data is very valuable to the engineering staff because the more that you have, the more you can understand when things need to be changed, like an air blower or a filter mm -hmm. or things like that. Do you guys have a 10 kilowatt in the, in the future? We actually have, we're working on one right now okay. for a range extender application, which is another good one. You know, everybody wants to do battery electrics, um, but the battery electrics, they just don't have enough energy right now. You know, the, the big advantage of the fuel cell isn't the power density, it's really the energy density. Mm -hmm. yeah. So batteries, they talk in you know, 150, 200 watt hours per kilogram. Fuel cells, we're looking at thousands, like 7,000 watt hours per kilogram for mm. the same equivalent. That's really the big advantage of the fuel cells. That's a good way to look at it. I know Another way to look at it, and I think a possible point is on one of your shows was that you, to get the range, yes, the batteries are out there, but you don't have the axle weight. Right. Right. You yeah. just cannot, you're, you're going to sacrifice your, what, cargo. your load, your yeah. cargo, or more battery, yeah. and then you're hauling all that battery around all the time. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, and you're yeah. you're using a lot of your energy just to haul around your battery. Yeah, yeah. So it's it just has a, a diminishing return. The we're not more battery. We're battery. not saying batteries don't have a place. They certainly sure. do sure. because uh, there is a definite benefit to the ability to to accelerate, yeah. and and then and the deceleration and storing the energy back is, is very important. But the um. Where the battery industry is going right now, they're going to higher and higher energy densities, which means more and more energy in one little cell, mm -hmm. right? And then you put, you know, thousands of these cells if you're a Tesla together, mm -hmm. and that energy stays there, and it's rather dangerous there too. Mm -hmm. The fuel cell, you know, it's, you know, it's yay big. It has hydrogen air in it, okay, but it really only has at any one point in time the energy content of maybe one or two of those little cells. So if something sure. happens there, it's not that big a deal. Right. You shut off the rest of the bottom's plane. You shut off the engine. The reaction is right. stopped. You stop the flow of hydrogen and, up and air into the plant. Right. Yeah. It's just like turning off your engine in your car. The ideally you know? sized battery is the one that's high power and safe, something like an LFP chemistry. And, you know, the, the base load being hydrogen and the fuel cell. That's mm -hmm. the safest vehicle I can think of. Yeah. Fuel cells, I think a lot of people are going to find, are going to be far more safer even than gasoline. Yeah. We, we actually work with the University of Hawaii, and they've done a fair amount of training of our firefighters, both city and county and federal firefighters, because a lot of the vehicles we've had come through our station at Hickam and also at Kaneohe, where Mitch Ewan has his station, uh, were being driven on the city roads and highways and the state highways. So we had to train firefighters so they knew yeah. what to expect. By the time they finish their training, they're all much more comfortable with hydrogen than they are with the gasoline uh, fire or vehicle incident. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if nothing else, they have nothing to clean up afterwards. Because mm -hmm. if the hydrogen escapes, it just goes straight up and makes clouds after a while, and that's it. Yeah. And they don't have to worry about any kind of hazardous cleanup. Or no oil to fall onto the ground. ground. Yeah, right. exactly. And that's Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Hey, awesome.